my name is Kelly Barnhill. Um, I've been a freelance writer for a long time because I realized a long time ago that they can't fire you. <laughs> Uh, I, um, uh, I've written 13 um, high interest nonfiction books for children. Uh, I've written four novels for children. Um, my most recent one is The uh, Girl Who Drank the Moon, um, uh, which won Lenny Berry. Um, and uh, I also write short stories, um, science fiction fantasy short stories for grown-ups that have been published in a lot of different places, but uh, recently a group of them were collected into a, um, a short story collection uh, called Dreadful Young Ladies, um, which is available from Algonquin. Have you published with Flash Fiction Online? Maybe a long time ago. I think I think I have actually. Because I'm like her name sounds really. Yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. I am the yeah. editor in chief of Flash Fiction Online. <laughs> I think a long time ago. I think you did. Yeah. I need to look that up. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I see thousands of short stories per year. Don't usually read all of them. Sorry. Um, <laughs> edit hundreds of short stories per year, and um, so obviously my that's my mode is short stories. Very short stories in particular. So um, you should all write flash fiction because it's a very challenging genre that will develop you as a writer in a very short amount of time invested. Yeah, agreed. My name is Catherine Curdy. I'm the author of the Burning Glass series with HarperCollins and the forthcoming Bone Grace duology. This is a really fantasy. good varied group. I <laughs> it is. I like so it. there's a lot yeah. of different sorts. Right, and I am Holly Anderson. I am an author um, as well as chief editor of Immortal, Immortal Works Press. And uh, as anybody who I have edited for can tell you, telling instead of showing is my pet peeve. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so this is a great panel. Um, all right, so let's, uh, we'll get started just, just asking a few yeah. questions of the panelists and then I'll try to get, we'll leave some time at the end for you guys to ask some questions as well, okay? Um, so let's start out. Uh, Give us some examples of uh, telling instead of showing, and let's go from there. Can you think of any? Show me. Such a like where to begin. Oh, it's, it's coming my it's way. It's coming your way. I was yes. just, you, you saw the wheel turning. It wasn't yeah. quite a coherent oh, thought. Noise. I was thinking mm, this might not be completely related, but I was thinking um, inner thought can be showing sometimes if if it's like if it comes off as dialogue in your head if that makes sense but if it comes off as you're explaining something in your head and sometimes we need a little bit of that i mean it can't you can't just purely show an entire novel or it will be a thousand pages long um but i know when i when i revise my books i have to be careful if if you find that your character is leaning a lot on inner thought in a scene it's probably that an entire different scene needs to be written from all those, instead of all that explaining, there needs to be a separate scene that shows that stuff. Do you guys find that, you know what I'm talking about? Like, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're leaning too much on explaining something and, it's, and it's, that's gonna bog down your, your scene, then that's just a good indicator that, that there's a separate scene that needs to be written, not in place of the scene that you're in right now. But another scene that's more um, in scene, happening, showing, immediate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if, if what you're writing covers a large amount of time in a short amount of space, if you tend to be writing in lots of big blocky paragraphs, if, um, if what you are talking about is an explanation of what's happened so that you can put into context what's happening now, that's all telling. And we do need some telling. We can't write entirely in showing. Um, but you need to have a good balance, mostly showing, not, not as much telling. You tell only to put in context what you're then going to show in action. Okay, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Um, so one of my many jobs um, uh, in my life, in addition to 
minivan wrangler, uh, is that I, um, uh, I, so I'm, I'm, I teach in the low residency um, MFA program at Hamlin University for um, uh, uh, children and young, children's and young adult literature. Uh, and I've, I'm only there one semester a year, and uh, it's a very cool job, I like it a lot. Uh, and one of the things that I talk to my students a lot about is um, uh, being able to um, uh, to boil things down into what I call the telling detail, right? Uh, and because there's there's a couple of things that go really wrong when we when we get what I like to call my tell my students it's an attack of the explanation gods, uh, and sometimes the, the explanation gods can attack for pages and pages and pages, and sometimes in an entire novel, uh, and that's a big problem. Um, and it's a big problem because it, it, it changes what this relationship is between the reader and the writer, right? Um, the whole reason why we're doing this is we're trying to write ourselves out of a job, you know? Um, and, and I don't mean that we don't write anymore, but the task of building the story is not the writer's job, it is the reader's job. Right, and so our job as writers is to, is to get the heck out of the way. Right, we build characters, we build worlds, we write really pretty sentences, and then, but then the work of the story is the reader's responsibility. It is not the writer's responsibility. And so when we go on and on with explanations, we are abdicating that. But we are, we are we are trying to take that away. Where it's like it's like a, being a control freak. Right. Um, and so, which isn't to say that we don't tell. Obviously, you do. We do. We're storytellers. We're not story showers, right? Um, <laughs> and um, and so there is there is something about the telling of the thing um, uh, that is important, right? Um, and uh, but we do have to realize that sometimes a single telling detail um, uh, can be used by the reader to build all kinds of marvelous things, and we need to get to clear a space around that detail to allow the work of the story building to happen in the mind of the reader because that is what is most important. I feel like, especially in earlier drafts of books, uh, the telling mostly happens when the author forgot to put something in. They're like, oh, and by the way, these characters hate each other. I'm just going to tell you that. You can't tell from the scene. I forgot to put it in there entirely, but they hate each other, believe me. <laughs> um, or, you know, by the way, like, they actually had this whole crazy plan that they all sat down and figured out, and, you know, they stole the schematics from wherever, and that's how they're doing this, and that's, that's why this whole thing works. But I, uh, you know, forgot to put that in there, so I'm telling you now, and, like, believe me that that happened. Um, and so, you know, which for your first draft is fine, you know, you need to know that that happened and you have to get to there at some point. Um, but then by the time, you know, your book is done, you've got to take that stuff out and show it to the audience and let them be a participant in that part of the story too. Okay. So, so I have an example. Um, okay. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Harry Potter, okay? Tell me. We're doing all we can to tell, tell you about to tell you. About, we're going. I'm going to show you. So the very the very first chapter of the very first Harry Potter book is all in the Dursleys' eyes. It's all normal, normal, normal. Everything needs to be normal. Anything abnormal, we ignore or we hate or we get rid of. Everything needs to be normal. And then you switch over to to this part where um, she basically just says, um, where J.K. Rowling says. Down off, uh, so, so basically Dumbledore sits down next to the cat. He didn't look at it, but after a moment he spoke to it. Fancy seeing you here, Professor McGonagall. He turned to smile at the tabby, but it had gone, but it had gone. Instead, he was smiling at a rather severe looking woman. We, uh, to this point, you don't know that there's magic, right? If you're a first time reader. She doesn't tell you, oh, this, this is magical. These guys are witches and wizards. She doesn't tell you that, she shows you oh, that cat turned into a person, right? So that's the difference between uh, telling and showing it, it, to, some, to some extent. Then also there's just like, um, so telling. I, uh, I had the most terrifying experience the other day. I, I experienced sleep paralysis for the first time. It was terrifying. Oh, and it was true, that really happened to me the other night. So I just I, told you that, right? That's cool. But if I'm writing a book, I, I don't want to. It's horrible and terrible and it's terrifying. terrifying. Wow. So, but, but 
but it, in a book, I wouldn't want to just say, hey, I just had some sleep paralysis. It was terrifying. That doesn't bring your reader in. That doesn't let them experience it with you, mm -hmm. right? You want to you show that, how terrifying that was. So for those of you who don't know what that is, I will show you. <laughs> um, started to doze off to sleep, fell asleep, woke up with a jolt, only the jolt was not my body, the jolt was inside me. My brain, my heart was racing. My brain was going, I could not move a muscle. I could not talk. I could not scream. Um, I was trying to alert my husband that something was wrong, <laughs> right? And so I'm screaming in my head. I, I'm screaming in my head, my heart is racing, and I'm telling myself at the same time, you know what this is, you've read about this, you're a nurse, you know what this is, it's gonna go away, it's okay, yet I'm still screaming, because it's horrifying. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't open my eyes, I couldn't talk, um, and, I, and it finally when it stopped, I, I elbowed my husband and I was mad at him because he didn't help me. <laughs> I was like, what? I said I was screaming for you. <laughs> Although I knew I hadn't been screaming. So it's horrifying and it's terrifying, but that shows you more about the experience than me just saying, I had sleep paralysis the other night, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's just, just an example. And if you want to talk about it later, I'm still processing it. <laughs> Don't fight it next time. Just go with it, and it will go away. Hopefully, there will not be a next time. It there will a, be. Sorry. It, well, it was a it was a bad it was a, uh, a bad effect of the medication that oh. I immediately stopped. Oh yeah. <laughs> so sure. hopefully, there will not be another time. <laughs> but but the thing is, I knew what it was. Yeah. You know? Okay. That's, yeah. <laughs> I thought I was being possessed by Satan or something. So. See? Right, it's, it's still terrifying, even knowing. Uh, anyway. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, next question. Um, so, showing is a continuum. How do you know if a work is on the right end of the spectrum? I don't even know what that means. Do you guys know what that means? That's I, just one yeah, of the seed questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when, when I'm looking through my slush pile, I, I see, uh, sorry, when I'm looking through my slush pile, I can glance at a story, just a, a physical manifestation of a story, and go, oh yeah, that is so full of telling, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. right. I look at a story, if I see lots of paragraphs of varying length, if I see dialogue, if I see, um, you know, if I see scene breaks, generally I'm not going to... These are good things. Long with These right, are all right, good, right. Things. good things, yes. This is what we're looking it, for. It's going to be lots of showing, but if I see big blocks of paragraphs, especially literary writers, Worst about that. I get so many. Token. One. Oh, worse. <laughs> worse. I'll get a story, a thousand words, one paragraph. I'm like, what the heck? It's just all telling. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, no dialogue. Um, so, so visually, there's this visual aspect to your story that that tells the editor or the agent that you're trying to shop that that you are doing way, way too much telling, and it's just a visual thing. I don't have to read a word. I can just go, oh gosh, that's just telling. Goodbye. Reject. Um, another telling trap is anytime you label an emotion or a feeling, that's just telling. Mm -hmm. It just is. And sometimes, you know, there, there are times every once in a while you have to, and usually the difference between when it's okay to tell and when it's okay to show is usually about the pacing of your book. For the really fast-paced, urgent, um, high-intensity scenes, there's very, very little telling because the reader does, they would just skip. They would just skim that part. They, it's all about they're the They're too pumped up. They just want to know what's happening. Mm -hmm. So um, be, be wary when you write down any emotion um, to explain what it looks like on their face or their tone of voice or just the dialogue in and of itself can be enough to convey that you're angry or sad or if you're looking at somebody or not looking at somebody like with the exchange there between um dumbledore and professor mcgonagall he didn't look at her because they were comfortable mm -hmm. it wasn't you know what i mean and he he knew what was going to happen you know, he, he wasn't startled in watching her transform. Here, here she is again. She's going to turn into a woman in a minute. Yeah. So yeah. that things like that, very, very small things, do so much in the mind of a reader, yeah. like what she was talking about. We take that and we build castles from that. Yeah, totally. And in the end, too, I think, I think the thing that we really do need to really focus on is what is this sentence doing, right? Because um, a, a sentence is a tool. 
and uh, and a sentence always uh, does more than one thing at one time. And so really making your sentences work for you uh, is is really paramount, I think. Um, uh, I mean, I think about um, uh, you know the first the first chapter of Harry Potter, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive were proud to tell you that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. We're <laughs> proud yeah. to tell you, right? That is so interesting because that is that is a sentence that tells and yet it shows so very, yes. very much. We're proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. What a weird thing to be proud of. What a weird thing to say I am proud of this and the use of that word at that point in that sentence does so much more than um, than really anything else. So where a word happens and how it is balanced within the, um, the context of a sentence. There's a book that I'll share with you that I really think, actually there will be a test. So. Um, <laughs> I'm going to write it down. Uh, it's write called A Few Short Sentences on Writing uh, by Verlin. I actually just wrote it because I, I knew I couldn't remember his last name. Uh, Klinkenborg, which is with an O and not a U, like the Borg. So spell it. Uh, Verlin is V-E-R-L-Y-N, and Klinkenborg is K-L-I-N-K-E-N-B-O-R-G. That book is brilliant, and it's incredibly useful. And, um, and really what it does is it breaks down everything that you know about um, writing sentences and really about how all of the things that your teachers taught you is super wrong um, <laughs> about being a writer. For sure it is. Uh, and uh, um, and so and so when we can boy, when we can actually uh, you know, in the revision process ask ourselves what is the sentence doing, and and what is it doing for uh, my story? What is it doing for what my reader is experiencing? And how does it stand on its own feet, right? Um, uh, then you can start to have a situation where an entire universe bra um, uh, uh, you know, sort of emerges from the use of the word proud right here. Right? right? It's how they would have said it. It's their voice. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it allows us to experience them, experience those characters on their own terms which is also important because in the end, when we're talking about showing versus telling, the problem, what we're, what we're actually talking about is what is the experience of the reader and how does the, how does the reader, you know, how do we build this relationship between the reader and the text? How do we build this relationship between the reader and the content? How do we build this relationship between the reader and the characters so that the reader can build it on their own? Um, I think a lot of figuring out where you need to show and where you need to tell has to do with uh, what uh, parts of your story the reader needs to feel and what parts they just need to know about. Yeah. Um, so good, if really good you thing. build up this whole big book and then and then they fought and the good guy won and that's it, like that's going to be completely unsatisfying, right? They need to feel that victory. So that's a moment you have to show. But, I mean, there's lots of points in your book that stuff happens that's not really all that important. It's not, you know, what they're paying attention to. At some point, they need to know about this. So, okay, great. Tell that. And we don't need it to be, you know, a 3,000-page book. Just put, put in a sentence. I don't need to see six scenes leading up to that and hear the whole backstory. <laughs> that's fine. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here for that, you know, final climax at the end. I'm here for that story arc with the main character. Uh, you know, so if it's something that your reader needs to be invested in, then you've got to show it to them. Because um, if you tell it to them, then they didn't create it, so it doesn't matter to them as much. They didn't get to participate in that part of the story. Great. So, um, so there are certain words that, as an editor and as a writer, um, I know that either I or the author are telling. Um, so let's go over some of those words. So, so was, was is sometimes one of those words. Um, mm -hmm. She was sad, mm -hmm. and that's that's telling. You're just telling me she's sad. Um, I. Quite often, we'll write in the margins. Show, show this. Show. How do you know she was sad? What did she look like? What did, what did her mouth look like? What you know? Sh show that she's sad. So was is one of those. And also the like. You, I think you mentioned the feeling words. 
Yeah, so I felt, I heard, I saw. She felt, she heard, she saw. Well, if you're telling a story through somebody else's eyes, um, the reader doesn't need to know that she felt, or she heard, or she saw. Mm -hmm. They just need to know what happened, right? Because you know, um, you know, a bird, a blue bird flew across the sky. You know that she saw that. You don't have to say, she saw a bird, mm -hmm. right? So what are some other words that tip you off that maybe you're telling? Pet peeves. <laughs> <laughs> Dialogue description words. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They are a hundred percent telling. Yes. You should so be able. Like, you should be able to like. Said. Like, he's he said, said blandly. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Like the right. Right. description of how he right. says the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hate that. They really Sorry. very rarely work, and you should be able to to get how the person is speaking through the context and what's happening in the story, okay? If it's a really exciting scene and things are happening, you can be pretty sure that they're speaking loudly and probably quickly, okay? Mm -hmm. But if it's like, oh, they're kind of, you know, talking about some stupid thing and I was some, you know, they're gossiping and, about the and girl. And she just showed you, arms folded. Right, and, you know. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're gossiping about the girl next door and it's like, oh, of course they're gonna speak kind of blandly, you know? So, so that should be taken from context, definitely not from descriptive words. Um, one of the, it's a very obscure tip, but one of the most helpful writing tips I ever learned, and, it, and come to think about it, it is a telling thing is when you say it grew silent. Whenever you talk about it being a silent time, and it happens all the time when we write those in books, you know, like there's there's conversation, and then it's then you're silent. But think about if you're talking to someone in real life and you're having a heavy conversation or a heated conversation and then there's a moment of where there's nothing. In that moment in real life, are you thinking, it is silent right now. There's <laughs> silence between us. No words are passing. No, you're thinking about all the things that you're either too worked up to say or you can't form words because you're so in love. There's something happening or, in, or if there's nothing, if there's really nothing going on here, then what are you actually hearing? Describe what is in the atmosphere around you, the ticking of the clock, the breeze, the whatever. There are so many beautiful ways to fill your, your writing with the, a better way to describe silence than just saying silence or a pause or a beat or a moment later, things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, <laughs> <laughs> the devil's it's always and and yet. I, I do think that we, we need to not be afraid of silence. Right. Um, I, so I had this really weird experience. I, I live on a block in Minneapolis um, where there's 38 children who live on my block. And my son is 14, and there are six other 14 year old boys, and they're constantly in my house. So you crave silence. <laughs> I do. I crave silence. But, for a lot, I, but it's also as a result, I just always am driving around a minivan that's just like filled to the rafters with boys. Um, and their shoes are the size of canoes. And they smell so bad. But when they were young, um, I, I, we had this ancient minivan that uh, the only thing that worked consistently properly on it was the VHS player. And, um, and so I started putting movies in when I would drive all of these children around because it gave me a reprieve from the near constant penis jokes. <laughs> and I just couldn't bear it another time. And I was, I remember, and so I, was, I would be listening to children's movies. Um, and it was really interesting how silence is used as a, um, as a way of communicating story. Um, especially, like for example, the movie E.T. What, turn the movie E.T. on and don't look at the pictures. And notice how they use silence as a character. It's really, really interesting. And so I do think that um, I, you know, I think that one of the mistakes that um, that writers, that young that uh, newbie writers makes is make is overwriting. Right? I need to fill the silence. I need to fill it. I need to fill it. Right? Um, uh, and I think that that's why they sort of overuse adverbs. Oh my gosh. I, I tell my students, just circle all the adverbs, and if you have to have it, fine. Otherwise, get rid of it, right? Um, uh, because, um, uh, because a lot of times, the, um, uh, I, you know, an adverb is just a stand-in for what really could be a blank line, a breath in the, um, in the narrative. 
Um, and that silence can actually do a lot, not just like to say it's silent, but yeah. to simply let it be silent, right? To let it be silent. Um, and, uh, and also to allow a gesture to stand for itself, right? Again, we don't want the, um, uh, uh, we don't want the explanation gods. If we have, a, um, if we have a character that notices a, um, a, um, a piece of paper on the table and just quietly lays their hand over it and, um, curls their fingers under and shoves it into their pocket and no explanation, we don't need to know why. We already kind of know, right? Um, I think uh, one of the words that always cues me that I am about to be told something is realize. Oh, yeah. um, because whenever Sorry. an author <laughs> can't figure out how to explain what is happening, their character realizes. Realize. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> um, and so, there, you know, that's definitely one of my cue words. And I also just wanted to kind of follow up with their kind of conflicting advice about mm -hmm. like the, you know. I think we're saying the same thing yeah. that you can use, just use, you can use that. Right. However, you know, it's a tool. Right. You can use and there's silence. never ever one yeah. way. There's always yeah. infinity ways. I think as authors, you guys are going to tend to tell certain stuff and you're going to tend to show certain stuff and some of you are going to show way more than you need to and you should practice your telling and some of you are going to tell <laughs> way more than you need to. And you should practice your showing. So if we're giving conflicting advice, it's because we're talking to different people who right. have these problems this is and true. they're both valid problems and you have to get the balance between them. Um, and so, you know, sometimes you have to show more and you have to, you know, fill the silences with the thoughts of your characters and sometimes you have to stop showing and just yeah. let your characters, um, you know, kind of speak for themselves and let your readers get involved in the story. And it does come back to what you said earlier, like, do we need to feel this moment or do we just need to get through this dialogue? Yeah. Like, we're not going to explain some beautiful silence in the middle of mm -hmm. right. something urgent or mm -hmm. something. Right. Yeah. I, think, I think another way to... to explain that is active versus passive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, which, which is kind of the same thing, it's showing versus telling. So, um, if, it's, if it's a fight scene, I don't want to see anything passive mm -hmm. in that fight scene as an editor. I want it all to be active, I want it all to be now, I want it all to be immediate, I want the hearts racing, and you know, the knuckles hitting, <laughs> whatever. Um, I don't want anything passive in that, no adverbs. <sighs> Suddenly, <laughs> sorry, the last thing I edited was suddenly, 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 <laughs> like every other paragraph. Yeah. So don't use that word. You don't need it because, because you don't. You, do, you just show what's happening, that it was, it, you know, the reader will pick up that it was suddenly, right? Yeah. So anyway, um, let's open up to you guys. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Yes. Oh, great question. Yeah, that is a great question. I, I think I do a little bit of both. Like if I catch myself doing too much telling, I'll change it right then. But I, like you said, if the flow is going, you just do it. You go back later and change that in your, in your own edits. Yeah, the draft one is a worry-free zone. Right. Yeah. You know, just, it's just, just it's a worry-free it zone. You don't, you don't worry about anything when you're writing your first draft. I mean, for me, um, all of my novels start with a box. Because um, I have to think about a book for a long time before I can write it. Um, uh, I have to, um, uh, and I just sort of throw things into a box. Um, and, um, and usually for like a year or two, I have to think about a book before I can start. And, um, and so when I start, I have a good sense of what I, the texture of the language and, um, uh, and what I am generally thinking that this, where this book is headed and, and what it is that I'm trying to do here. You know, um, but but no matter what, I think you know. With this question of um, you know, is my are my sentences doing what I want them to do? Um, uh, am I you know, are am I have being attacked by the explanation gods? Like all of these questions, like all of that happens in the um, uh, in you know in the second, third, and fourth draft. And I'll tell you what, I do all of my revision out loud. Um, because your eye is super forgiving. Your eye will forgive all kinds of stuff, and your ear is a 
bastard, right? <laughs> it won't, it won't, it will not let you get away with anything. Um, and so um, I, I, I do all of my revisions out loud. I read it again and again. I, I perform it to my dog, Sirius Black. He's a wonderful <laughs> listener. Uh, he's nothing like his namesake. He wouldn't last five minutes in Azkaban. <laughs> very needy. It's a very needy Labrador. Um, but um, but it's um, but I another thing I do is I'll have my manuscript in front of me. I'll record myself reading it, and then I'll listen with the manuscript in front of me and take notes um, uh, because um, and that can be super instructive as well. Um, so, but in, in terms of first draft, I, I think I think the um, newbie writers make a mistake of um, wanting things to be perfect, right. and um, and and that you know um, no art can happen when you're tri when you're striving for perfection. Um, I, you can only muddle through. I think. So I have kind of a mathematical approach to story construction. So for me, there's a there's this really intense mathematical equation that you can put together that will that will that will establish how long your story to, is going to be within like 50 words right so depend no matter what how length how long it is and and this is true too there's this ratio between showing and telling that's going to be the same whether your story is 500 words or 500,000 words mm -hmm. okay it's really going to be very very similar so that's why you should write flash fiction, because you can write a story in less than an hour and work on the aspect of that showing versus telling ratio as you do another few hours of edits on this story, okay? A couple of hours down the road, you've got a story that has taught you something and a story that may be marketable in just a couple of hours that you can start shopping out. Anybody you else? You can do that? another question. Yeah. Um, this is something I feel like this might be a little bit more of the same, but something that I struggle with is trying to figure out how to get, I guess, both showing and telling in there without making what ultimately is a, it should be a short scene not drag on forever and ever and ever. Um, yeah. That makes sense. Oh, yeah. It's the, it's the nobody has left the living room problem, right? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, um, and so you know, in a lot of ways, I think you know, having sort of uh, taking a, a cue from Kurt Vonnegut and being unstuck in time um, is really important um, because because it is really true that um, I when when we sort of like hear these sort of rules um, of um, okay, so we I have to show and don't tell like. That's, that's what I have to do, which means that like, I mean, do I have to go down to the cellular level? Like, I mean, where, where does it stop? <laughs> and so I think that if you notice yourself doing that, right? I, we have been, I, it's eight pages and literally like they've, nobody's gotten up yet. You know, and um, and and I'm pretty sure it's like the murderer's outside, and the murderer can't come in either. Like nothing's happening, you know. <laughs> and uh, um, and so I think that when you notice that happening, that that means like that that's just as a signal. Like okay, I'm I'm stuck here, and so I need to actually remove everybody. So um, uh, uh, you know, you take your little pieces off of, off of your off of your game and and drop them somewhere else, and just make them do some. You know, and and sometimes they will lead you back to where you were, and sometimes you j it just means I need to put this scene away because the scene isn't working, right? Um, and um, and so usually all of those things are are a signal that something else has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, probably you need to focus on what your main character wants mm -hmm. in that scene, and I like to think of like scenes or chapters as like. A book in and of themselves, they should have like the same yeah. structure as a book. Like they should, they should have like an opening hook, mm -hmm. and they should like get, reach a climax and have some kind of re resolution or cliffhanger. You know what I mean? Something to keep you. So, in order for it to have that kind of arc, someone needs to want something, and something has to be in their way. So we can show tell the cows come home like anything we want to, but no one's going to be invested in that story, and we're not going to. You've got to have that like motor behind it all, propelling you to move forward, and that's the, what they want. Right. Yeah. You know, each each scene has a purpose, right? 
And if you understand what that purpose is, you should be able to write down the purpose of this sentence is blah, 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 blah. And then you write to fulfill that purpose, you're much less likely to just keep going and going and going and going. And if you focus on the want, then you know all the stuff you don't even have to talk about. We don't have to show everything. Mm -hmm. You just gotta concentrate around the wants and the What's conflict. What's filling that right? purpose, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? You guys all have it, huh? Are we actually that good? Questions on anything. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Um, so, do you have uh, any advice for people who are thinking about starting a That's what I was going to recommend is the emotional bookstore, Ooh. right? Honest, honestly, read fiction. Mm -hmm. Read and yeah, analyze. Read, really, yeah, analyze, read and read analyze really. everything you read and go, okay, what's the, you know, you got a scene. What's the purpose of this scene? What's the purpose of this scene? How is the author structuring this? This scene it to the get this purposes across. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I mean. I'm sorry. I <laughs> I very rarely read a book anymore where I go, oh my gosh, that was a great book. I'm this editor, and so I'm picking out. Oh, that was a crappy sentence. Blah blah blah. I can't read a book for enjoyment anymore. It's just not. Sorry, hate to ruin it for you, but but yeah, use the stuff that you're reading and analyze how they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing too. Um, so there's a book you should read. Um, uh, uh, in terms of, um, uh, in ter and I'm I'm gonna forget the author, but I'll tell you the title. It's called The War Saved My Life. It's a, um, a historical fiction. Um, it just won some award. I forget what. Um, and um, it's The War Saved My Life. Yeah, it's a magnificent book. And one of the things that the, what she does with that, um, in terms of showing and not telling. Um, it is very slim. It is incredibly like economical the way that she um, uh, uh, pulls the story forward. But in terms of an emotional language, um, and in terms of like how really, really profound um, emotions and um, and and a really like tough situation is um, is described and um, and experienced. Yes, that's it. The war Kim, that saved the, the my war life. that saved my life. Kimberly Brobaker Bradley, right? Brubaker. Brubaker. Yeah. Brubaker Bradley. Um, it's a magnificent book, and you know it'll probably take you two days. But if you wanted to do like a close read and just really look sentence by sentence and chapter by ch and, and paragraph by paragraph and asking yourself, how is she doing this? Right. Another thing, I um, uh, I I make my my students do a close read of the first chapter of um, uh, *Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe* all the time. I mean, that book is amazing, um, uh, and, and and particularly that that first chapter where um, you have not very many words on the page because it's big font and a lot of space around each letter, um, and yet um, by page one and a half. We know every single kid. We know how they feel about each other. Uh, we know what their situation is. We know what's pushing them forward. We know what their big questions are. And by five, they're inside the freaking wardrobe. You know, like, not, it doesn't take very long, right? And, um, and so I think that that could be, in terms of um, uh, uh, a text that will teach you both clarity and economy, that's it, right? I'm going to recommend one other oh, yeah. book. Here. It's, sorry. So, it's ahead. just for you fantasy and science fiction writers, okay? It's called The American Fantasy Tradition. Oh, yeah. It's a collection of short stories um, put together by a guy who really understands this, the genres and um, has, has included just some of the greatest classics from everything from, from Nathaniel Hawthorne, we're talking, you know, Ew. 18th century, earlier, all the way up to fairly modern times. The book's probably 30 years old. It's probably been out for 20 or 30 years. But, but look at the difference between the older authors who told a lot, okay, and, and the more current authors because conventions have changed. And so we do a lot more showing now than we did then. So study the difference between those authors of the 18th and 19th centuries and the authors of the 20th, of the 20th, the 20th mostly. No 21st century authors in there yet. Yeah. But anyway, great, great little study guide for you. Cool. 
right, we are running out of time here, so let's uh, take just a time for one more. One more question? Should we take we one more? I know somebody. Question. Go ahead. Sometimes just showing what they're doing mm -hmm. instead of making it all dialogue. Mm -hmm. Show the look on his face, the tear that streams down his cheek, the, you know, her surprise, her, you know, show what she's doing. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. also just what she notices. Yeah. Because what a person notices says so much about them, right? right? Um, and so, so, again, everything needs to, needs to accomplish more than one thing at the same time. Right, um, uh, and so so you're you are uh, revealing what has happened to hi to him, but you're also revealing his character, what he's what he's communicating, and what he's clearly holding behind. Right, and you are also revealing her character, her sense of compassion or worry, as well as what she notices and what the reader notices, but she's blind to. Right, so there's a lot of things happening, and a lot of things can be accomplished um, uh, uh, by um, uh, uh, by just showing what people notice and what they say and what they withhold. And most, most people are resistant to share their pain, to talk about it. Yeah. So I think for a scene like that, it's like a good kissing scene or a love scene, honestly. Like it's about the foreplay, like what leads, like there can be tension in and of that scene itself rather than just talking about what happened before like what brings them to the point where he's actually vulnerable enough to be willing to share the pain, mm -hmm. that might help is like the setup before they even talk about it. Right. So yeah. it might actually even add to the emotional impact if he won't talk about it and yeah. she has to find out yeah. in some other way and tell about it. Right, yeah. Right, figuring things that out. That adds tension. Mm -hmm. It does indeed. See, there, there's, there's the use we're telling. We're going to write good. it for you. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're on it. <laughs> All right, so parting words. Um, parting words from the panel, and where can we find you this weekend? Okay, so we have something urgent they want to say. <laughs> Just tell where Just you're going to be yeah. next. <laughs> Um, have fun while you write, guys. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah, you, just... to to feel, you have to let go. Yeah. Like she's saying, while you write, listen to music, do whatever like gets that muse going, and like feel and get it out, and then go back and pick it apart. Yeah. But try as much to feel when you're initially putting it out there. Yeah. Sorry, I took over. <laughs> <laughs> you were, you gave me a pause, and I took it. <laughs> <laughs> Filling silence. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we've kind of been in a lot of different places with uh, all of the uh, just advice on where to show and where to tell, um, but I think whenever you're writing a story, um, don't forget that like the point of your story is to make your readers feel something, and so the words have no purpose if they don't, you know, bring about that emotion so like don't worry too much about all the like you know, technical stuff don't like get all caught up in your head about that i know lots of editors who can write really beautiful first chapters but could never ever write a book because they just they can't they can't, can't get, get past, past that yeah. Um, yeah. so you know don't don't That's get me. too caught up in your head about the specifics <laughs> especially on that first draft and just like focus on the emotions and focus on that overarching story and you know then the rest will kind of fall into place as you practice that as you get used to that so Totally. Yeah, um, just feel everything. Feel everything. Because this job is really hard. It's, it's really hard to write a freaking book. It's really hard. Nobody should do it, and yet here we are. <laughs> um, and, um, I, and this job breaks your heart sometimes. And so, and the reason why we do it is because we are creatures of story and because our brains work in narrative. Um, uh, we've been telling stories since before we could talk. Did you know that? True story. Um, uh, our first our first stories were songs. Um, uh, our, our, then later on we developed um, dance, and then we developed art. And it wasn't until later that we developed language. Um, uh, and it came in a flash, too, which is kind of cool. So we've been doing this for a long time, and it is what makes us human. And so it's important to remember that, that like I'm part of this ancient practice. And I'm doing this so that I can be in this place of radical empathy. 
um, and that I can feel everything, and I can think as another thinks, and see as another sees, and know as another knows. And that is kind of beautiful. And so if we can focus on that part, then all, everything else will, will, will take it, will work itself out in the wash. Um, I'm going to be doing a bunch of stuff, so you know, whatever. I'm in, I'm in here, and I'm giving a keynote and whatever. So uh, you can find me. I'm around. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Write flash fiction. Yeah. Yes. Really Unfortunately, do. Unfortunately, there are no good books on how to write flash fiction. I might have to correct that myself <laughs> sometime in the near future. But log into flashfictiononline.com and read what's there because it's the best best flash fiction on the net. Not that I'm biased, but it's true. Because, <laughs> because we only publish three stories a month. Most of the others publish 12 a year or one a day. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to find one story a day to publish for your, for your easing, it's really difficult. And you have to take some mediocre stuff to fill those pages. So read Flash Fiction online. Study how they do it. Write it, because it's just going to help you be a better writer. Um, next hour, I'm doing a reading of my book. Um, and my friend Emily R. King is doing one of hers in Sycamore. And my name's Catherine Purdy. I'll be around. Yeah. Come see me. Thanks for coming. Thank you.